share. We'll have it live on YouTube on KISS anyway, and we'll keep it recorded. And I'm recording on the cloud so here. We'll have it live on YouTube. All right, share screen. So, Carlo, Chaslav, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. And can you see? Uh, yes. Can you see now the slides of Pierre in your yes. screen? Yes. All right. And you can see Pierre on the background too, right? <laughs> also, Hi, Pierre. Yes. <laughs> hi, hi. Okay. So, I will not waste time since we've had a bit delay. We have, have Pierre. Uh, with us today. Uh, he was uh, previously PhD at Marseille at uh, the Quantum Gravity Group at the Center for Theoretical Physics. We had an overlap of one or two years, I think. And uh, he's now a postdoc at Penn State University. We'll be talking about causal structure and quantum gravity. Thank you, Marius. Uh, thank you all for staying here in spite of uh, small technical problems. So I'm going to talk about Causal structure in quantum gravity. And this is a uh, work which was done in collaboration with uh, Eugenio Bianchi, Penn State. And so, behind this title, there is an underlying question that we are investigating is uh, whether causality is a fundamental concept or either emergent. Uh, so, at the quantum gravity level, should we see directly causality? Or should we only see it at, at some coarse grain level? This is the question we want to investigate, the general framework. And so uh, this is my plan. I will uh, start with very basics, um, general relativity, trying to say again what I mean by causality there. And then we will slowly go towards spin foams. Uh, so spin foams are formulation of covariant loop quantum gravity. And these are eventually the models that we want to look at. And so we will go progressively from GR to spin foams through different steps. Uh, first, we will introduce discreteness. Uh, then we will look at the surface degrees of freedom. Uh, then we will introduce some dynamics and then going to, to the quantum. All right. So first of all, uh, kinematics of general relativity. So I say kinematics. Uh, because I'm not going to put Einstein equations here. I'm just interested in what, what is the mathematical structure. And the mathematical structure uh, of the variables is given on a manifold and a differentiable manifold, which is uh, four dimensional, and a metric. And this metric, G, is a Lorentzian metric. So by Lorentzian, I mean that it has a signature. Uh, which is a one and three. So one is the direction of time, uh, this one direction, and then the three other directions of space. And, and so some, usually people, when they give the signature, they specify uh, whether eta is one or minus one. But, but actually this is not in general relativity. General relativity is agnostic about whether the time direction should have the signature one or minus one. So I want to keep it general. That's why I, I put this variable eta. Uh, yeah. So now what is uh, a causal structure in, G in GR? The causal structure is the light code structure. So by this, I mean that at every point on my manifold, I can draw locally a light code. Uh, there's a mathematical way to formulate this more precisely, which is to say that because that structure is an equivalence classes 
uh, that I can put on my tangent space. And this equivalence class between the vectors on my tangent space uh, is defined by this. There are three classes the time like, the null, and the space like vectors. And, and, and to know whether a vector is uh, time like, null, space like, what I do is just have to compute the norm with my metric. Uh, and then I look at the sign of this norm. Is it eta or minus eta or zero? It's not. So this is my causal structure in GR, and um, I would like to point out. To, yeah, let's finish. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, um, so what is what? For what sort of information does the causal structure? What sort of information does the causal structure call for this? What kind of what, what kind of information? information? Whether a vector is time-like or mm -hmm. space-like, what is the information? Where would you use the causal structure information? What would you use it for? What is it important for? Yeah, I mean, in sure, um, uh, it's a very general question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really basic. If you want to describe what is the geometry of your space time, which is the goal of general relativity, uh, the geometry what, what, in general relativity, the geometry is given by the metric, and within the metric, we can uh, see that there is this causal structure. So mm -hmm. the causal structure is part of the global ge geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming to, to this in, in one second. Uh, just before I wanted to point point out to you that in this GR picture, there is no time arrow. Okay, I'm not I'm not saying whether this is future or whether this is past. It's not encoded in the kinematics of general relativity. It, it, it's making a distinction between what is time and what is space. But it's, it is not making a distinction between what is past and what is future. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and this is also true at the dynamical level because in the dynamics, if I look at Einstein equations, the Einstein equations they are symmetric uh, under time reversal. So if I want to put some time arrow, I need to introduce something else which is not there in the kinematics of GR. I have to to, to say uh, to, to put an arbitrary vector everywhere, and I said this. That, that it's pointing to the future direction. But that's arbitrary level. Uh, so going back to Lefteru's question, which was what, what is the information which is captured by the causal structure? Well, the precise answer to this is given by a theorem, which is Malaman's theorem. Okay, Malaman's theorem is telling us something really nice. It's saying that the metric, so G, uh, G mu nu, is uh, the causal structure plus a conformal factor. Um, so the conformal factor, what is it? It's a scalar function that I put everywhere in my space time, a scalar function. And you can think of it kind of a, a local volume. Okay, if my conformal factor is big, it means I have a local volume, which is quite big. And so the causal structure from the causal structure, you can recover almost everything about your, your geometry. Almost everything up to some local notion of volume, which is the conformal factor. And so, um, yeah, so you see at, at the classical level, general relativity, the causal structure is there. It's, it's, uh, it's very standard, and we are using it in many kind of theorems. It's uh, the standard background of GR. And, and the question that we want to address is whether it is still there or not at the quantum gravity level. Is it still uh, a key ingredient or not? So now, uh, before going to quantum gravity, let's go step by step. I want to discretize. So what is the discretization of my manifold? Let's start in two dimensions. So I'm starting with two-dimensional differentiable manifold, the sphere, for instance, and I'm discretizing it. So this means I'm, I'm, I'm building some homeomorphism towards a new mathematical structure which is built from uh, small flat things, which are triangles in this case. And so this object is called a complex, a complex of triangles. And so the, the building block of this structure is a triangle. I'm going to say very trivial things, but that's to make it clear for later. The triangle is made of three segments, uh, which are the boundary of the triangle. And there are also points which are uh, three 
which are the boundary of the segments. All right, that's a discretization. But I'm going to go one step further by going to the dual representation. So in the dual representation, I'm replacing every triangle by a vertex, every segment by a link, and every point by a face, which is not pictured here in the face. So it's just a, a dual uh, picture. And I, what I get is a graph, uh, the dual skeleton. And um, yeah, that's it. So now that was two dimensional, is the enough. And now we go to four dimensions. So we start with a four dimensional manifold uh, with a Lorentzian metric and we discretize it. And the way we discretize it is going to give a complex again, but not a complex of triangles. It's going to be a complex of a four synthesis. And so what is a four simplex? A four simplex is a generalization of a triangle to four dimensions. Um, so the, it's, it's, we, we cannot really uh, imagine it properly geometrically. So I've just put this kind of blobs. Uh, I cannot picture it. Uh, but what these blobs are made of, it's important to have the structure um, of these blobs of these four simplices. And the structure is given by boundary. And so on the boundary of this four simplex, I have a five tetrahedra. And uh, these tetrahedra themselves, they are made of triangles. 10 triangles in total and these triangles are also made 10 segments and these 10 segments are made of five points so this is the, the structure that we have and i'm going to assume is an assumption that i'm putting at this level that my discretization is so that uh, the tetrahedra are space-like it's going to be used less. So, so, so what does it mean that the tetrahedra is space-like it means that it lies Within a night pair surface, which is space like. Okay, so I've completed the first step. Now let's do the second step, which is dualization. And here it is. So I replace every four simplices uh, by uh, vertices, uh, the tetrahedron by link, the triangle by face. And what I get also is the dual skeleton, uh, which is there. So here, each four simplex had five boundary tetrahedra. So here, each node, each, each vertex, sorry, has five surrounding edges. And these edges, they carry a local arrow of time. Okay, this is possible because I assume that they had space like tetrahedra. So I can put to all arrows a local arrow of time. And, and, and this is giving me the light cone structure, um, but a bit more than this, because it's also giving me a notion of past and future. I can say this uh, vertex is uh, past to that vertex. And so by, by doing the dual space and putting some local arrows, I'm introducing a degeneracy too, which is that I'm, I'm introducing this uh, choice of what is past, what is future. But that, that's not a problem. Yep. So I didn't quite hear it the first time. Please can you just say again what the definition of the space like that you use? Yeah. So a space like tetrahedron is a tetrahedron that you can embed in a space like hypersurface. And a, a space like hypersurface um, is a three dimensional surface which has normals which are time like. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So. So precisely these arrows, if you want, these arrows, they are the normals to these tetrahedra. And since these tetrahedra are, are, are space-like, these arrows are, are time-like, and that's why I can put an arrow. Yeah. Really? You mentioned your school, the sphere of the degeneracy is in the two direction of time. But is it a global degeneracy for the full search? Yep. Is it at each point you have to yeah, it's, it's a global degeneracy. Okay. Yeah, the global degeneracy by this, I mean that, yeah, I could have I've made a choice that the arrows were pointing in that direction. I could just revert all the arrows mm -hmm. and I would get another dual station mm -hmm. which uh, corresponds to the same uh, complex of the four synthesis. Somehow, when one arrow is hit, all the other. Exactly. Exactly. 
Uh, mathematically, how do you encode these arrows? What are they? They are the four normals. What, what are they? Uh, yeah, so um, here at this level, you have a notion. If you take two, four simplices in your discretization, um, because they are space like, you have a notion of uh, one is in the future of the other, or one is in the past of the other. You have such a notion. And you, you just translate it here by putting an arrow. I see. Yeah. Just yeah. you have a link. You have a link between them two. Just if the two tray drop or, or touching. Okay. Sure. This, if you want, this what? Yeah. Uh, the the links here they are dual to to tray drop. And so yeah, if here in this picture I have two tray so, drop which are touching. So two it, four synthesis which are touching with the tray drop in between. It means that they will have two vertices with a link. If you conventionally choose one to be past and future, you get some arrows and then you can flip all of them. Yeah. If you change the position. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, maybe maybe another question. How do you make sure that you get kind of a, a, a tree structure? Oh, <coughs> right. So, okay. I've not probably specified all the hypotheses that are required here, but one of the hypotheses which is required to have a consistent construction. Is that you do not have closed time lab flips, okay. otherwise you get. Okay. I mean, it's, it's somehow, at least level maybe you could do that. Just, I'm going to assume there are no such pathological cases. Okay. Something quite simple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But all this is quite basic. I mean, there's nothing very uh, difficult about that. Just have blobs of space time which are uh, organized in such a way that they have a causal structure. And so I can say, uh, Oh, which are ordered. It's just blocks of space, space and which are ordered. And this order is my causal structure. You had a question? We're having a tough time visualizing it. It's easier for people to talk. Speak up so they can hear from. Sorry, I'm having a tough time visualizing this. Um, so I'm trying to just think about what this would look like in two dimensional space or one plus one dimensions, if you like. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah. In, in two dimensions, so here I, I have not put uh, any metric. So here I don't have any um, light cone structure. That's why there are no arrows here. But it, that would just be the same. I would put, I mean, if I say, for instance, that this, uh, these two, they are touching. So I could say that this one is in the past of this one. And so in this picture, it would mean that they would put an arrow here, just the same. So, so whenever. Two different two simplices touch. You can say the one is in the future of the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So when yeah, when the two forces so in this picture, yeah, when two four synthesis touch, when two blocks of space time touch to each other, then I will have an arrow in between. That's it. Mm -hmm. Just that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Your assembly it seems that in two dimensions or in one plus one dimension, it seems that the fight that we do any potential with that closed time that code. So maybe not not this not like that in two dimensions. So say again. Um, in, in two but in one plus one dimension, yeah. it seems that if any two triangles are touched, you need to have some kind of power time. It seems as if you would unavoidably have a close time that code. No, 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 I don't think so. Okay. Uh, maybe that's confusing here because I took a sphere. But uh, you don't have no, to have a sphere. because of the topology, you already know. No, no, you can have, you can, no, no, not this. You can have a triangulation of triangles, and all the triangles are ordered in a causal way. So some are in the past or in the future, you just have arrows between them. That's what is possible. Perhaps, you don't necessarily have close time. What is perhaps confusing is it's crucial the fact that we're in Mikowski and he's taking the sub sequences to be space like. Yeah. Right. If you're if you're just in Newtonian space, this is uh, you're not going to make sense of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. just, just to illustrate this, um, would it be possible to sketch a triangulation of, of one plus one Minkowski, um, which doesn't run into some kind of self-consistency issue? It doesn't have close time like curves. Uh, I just can't imagine this one existing. All of the triangles are meant to be uh, space-like. Uh -huh. In one plus one, I can't even imagine how you could try to do that. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, I, I, yeah, I suggest we discuss this later. Yeah. But, uh, 
Yeah, just send, yeah, yeah, uh, maybe let's leave him cover yeah. and you can discuss yeah. later. So if you, if you trouble with by this procedure and just forget the beginning and just retain this, and this is my causal structure, I want to work on from now on. So just have a graph, which is, uh, yeah, just a graph with arrows, directed graphs. And this is encoding some very intuitive notion of causality. Mm -hmm. Things are in the past, things are in the future. It's just that. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing that we can take this from the specialization, but to get in the end is very simple. Um, and what I wanted to say is that just to make a bridge with causal set, so maybe I was thinking some of you could ask. So if you take this graph and, and you complete it by doing the transitive completion, what you get is a causal set. Okay, but to, to make this completion is just to, yeah, to have a transitivity. Uh, but by, by making this completion, you're also losing a lot of information because you are adding arrows everywhere. And so you, you, you are losing information if you're doing this. So I'm not going to go into scars on set. I'm really starting with my uh, dual skeleton with local time All right, so, so this, this way of encoding causality was done on a graph. On the dual one skeleton, mm. and and this might somehow seem obvious because that's the intuitive way of things thinking about uh, causality. We have local time arrows, mm. but there are other ways to implement causality, and we can implement it on um, dual the dual two skeleton. Mm. So what is the dual two skeleton? Um, I'm I'm not only considering the vertices and the edges. In my construction, but I'm also cons considering the faces, which are dual to the triangles. Okay. So I'm retaining these faces in between, which are two-dimensional objects, and I'm going to encode causality on these faces. This is what I want to do. I want to encode the same information, which is here given by the arrows, but just looking at the faces. And more precisely, I'm going to encode it on the wedges. So what is a wedge? A wedge is a face which is attached to some given vertex. And another way to say it, if, if I take two edges, I have a wedge in between. Okay. And if I take many wedge, I can reconstruct a face. Okay. Because a face is going to be surrounded by many vertices. For which vertices, there, there will be a wedges. Okay. All right, so how do we do this? We need to go through some algebraic description of this. This was very graphical, just graphs, arrows. Now let's go to some algebraic stuff. So how do I do this? Um, I'm going to define this subject, which is, which is the orientation of an edge with respect to some vertex. And so this number, is going to be minus one if it's incoming. If the edge is incoming with respect to that vertex, it's minus one, it's clear. And if it's outgoing, I'm going to say it's one. And so, I, given such a graph, I can compute the value of the orientation for all edges attached to vertices. Simple. Now, there's the question. What if I want to do the other way around? What if I want to start by giving you this algebraic data and I ask you, can you reconstruct such a graph? Yeah, you can do this at the one condition is that you need to satisfy this constraint, which is a causal constraint. So what, what this constraint is telling you is, is very simple. It's just saying that if I have one edge attached to two vertices, then the orientation of the edge with respect to one of the two vertex should be the opposite of the or orientation of this edge with respect to the other vertex. Okay. It just means if one edge is incoming for, for one vertex, it's outgoing for the other. That's just a way to attach all the vertices together in a consistent global picture. So that's the constraint that I have. I'm going co I'm calling it causal constraint to have a bijection, bijection between this algebraic representation and this graphical representation of the incoming. Right. Now I want to do the same thing here on the wedge. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to define also some orientation 
the orientation of the face with respect to the vertex. So the orientation of the wedge. This is what the wedge is. It's a face with respect to a vertex. And the orientation of my wedge is, is, is the following: is that I'm going to say eta, eta. That's the value of the signature. Remember, it's plus or minus one. So it's eta. If the two um, edges are cochronal, so they point in the same direction, either they are both incoming or they are both outgoing, and it's minus eta. This Antichronal, and this is if one of the edge is ingoing and the other is outgoing, uh, or the other way around. So in this picture, you may wonder what the colors are green and red correspond to. It correspond to this distinction. The red wedges they correspond to cochronal wedges, and this means that they are enclosing some portion of of time, while the the, the green wedges. And closing some portion of space, and they are defined by antichronal edges. So you see here with the graph, I have directly drawn in the picture a distinction between past and future of the arrows. And here on the wedges, I have a distinction between time and space. And now I want to connect this two way representation and saying, okay, how do I, I go from one to another? To the, to the other to the, to the, to the other one. Is this what we used to call thin wedge and thick wedge? Yes, exactly. Yeah. This is uh, so, Crystal. Uh, I never know which one is which. I would have to think two, two seconds. Thick. One is thin and the other is thick wedge in the language thick. of loop. Of thick is when the normals are timeless. Yeah. Thick corresponds to uh, uh, this one, cochrane. Thick. It's, it's both pointing the same direction. Yeah. Thick, thin. Right. Right. All right, so how do I connect to them? Uh, I, I can connect them uh, very easily, actually, with, with this relation. Okay. Because one wedge, one face, is bordered by two edges. And so I have this relation, which is that um, if, I take, if I take these red wedges, it is uh, cochronal, it's equal to eta. And it's bordered by two edges, these two yellow ones, which are both incoming. And so if I multiply this minus one twice, I get eta. That's the value uh, I can recover. Okay. But, and so uh, this is the, the relation which bridges this representation on the wedges, the orientation on the wedges, and the representation on the edges. It's not completely a bijection. Okay, it's uh, one to two uh, morphism. And, and why, why is that so? It's because when we are going to the wedges, we are losing the time hour. Okay, it's again this, this, this fact that we have uh, here something more, which is a global time hour. We are saying what is past, what is future. And this is not present in this encoding. That's just the degeneracy that we have between the two pictures. And so now the question is, uh, it is I need to, to bridge this graphical representation, this algebraic one, uh, just like before. And the question is, if I give you a set of orientation for all my wedges, can I reconstruct uh, a global causal structure for my uh, discretization? And the answer is yes. But you see, no. If for each vertex, for each vertex in this case, you have five half edges. But in this case, you have more variables because you have more faces surrounding a vertex. So you have, you have more wedges, you have 10 wedges. And so since you are enlarging your face space, you'll just have more variables. It means also that you will have to put more constraints. And the constraints that you have is this one. If I give, give you a set of wedge orientation, you want to reconstruct some causal structure on the wedges, you need to have this condition. So it's a, a condition which says that if I multiply the value of the orientation on, of the wedges around a cycle, and a cycle is a sequence of wedges that closes. So for instance, it's the, the three red wedges above, it's, it's closing. 
So it's making a cycle. And, and the condition is that on each cycle, the product of them should be a constant, um, this number, which is the signature to the cardinal of the cycle. Okay, if, you, if it's not completely clear uh, what is this constraint, uh, never mind, just consider there is constraint on this variable, and I call this code Kazan constraint. So this is the general picture we have. And that's, uh, yeah. Have you said uh, if you impose this causal constraint, what you get or in mathematics or? Well, I don't understand the question. So if you impose, okay, there are small possibilities. You have these variables, the fake values, uh, these combinatorial variables. If you impose this causal constraint, what? Then you can reconstruct um, a global causal structure. Right, but that's in words now. Do you have an equation for what you just said? Um, yeah, it's, it's no, no, it's, it's not an equation because I'm. It's. it's I, I want to go from algebra to graphical reconstruction. So it means. All right. Another way to say it is. All right. Another way to say it is, um, if I have a set. Of, of wedge orientation, which satisfy this constraint, mm -hmm. then I can apply this relation to build this graph. Okay. 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 If I, if I just take any random orientation assignation of orientation to the wedges, mm -hmm. I will not be able to go through this uh, relation. Mm -hmm. If I want to go through through this by almost by injection, I need to have this constraint. Okay. Sure. Yep. That's all right. So, why why is it that I'm doing this? Okay. Because here we had some kind of clear understanding of the light cone. Here with the wedges, it seems to to not be so intuitive. Like because we have ten wedges which are around the vertex, which is hard to to imagine because the faces they intersect. And so, why is it that I want to make this translation? We may think it's just a mathematical translation of the causal structure. The thing is that um, when you want to quantize gravity, it's important to know what are the relevant degrees of freedom of gravity, because you can formulate the same classical theory of gravity with different choice of fields. Like you can use the metric field, that's Einstein, but you have all the formulations, like you have the formulation of Einstein Carton, which is using tetrads and connections. And depending on the choice of fields that you make at the beginning, you, you are going to get different quantization procedure. And so the choice of variables that you make at the beginning, at the classical theory, matters not at the classical level, but at the quantum level. And so here we want to look at what is the quantization of causality, but it's going to be, the answer is going to be different whether I'm taking causality encoded on the one dimensional object, which are these edges, or on two dimensional object, which are the wedges. It's not going to be the same thing. And, and it is a fact that gravity, the metric field can be encoded on, on two dimensional object. And, and this was uh, what's called Klebansky formulation. The Plebansky formulation of general relativity tells you that you can formulate general relativity with fields which live on two dimensional surfaces, which are two forms. It's just a mathematical way to say it. Um, here, if you want, you would have like tetrads, so one form uh, for your fields, and here you would have two forms, uh, the B field of Plebansky formulation. And, and I'm adding to towards spin foam uh, theory and spin foams, they can be seen as a quantization of Plebansky formulation. And so for, if I want to look at what is causality in spin foams, it is natural to, to look at, at degrees of freedom which are encoded on the surfaces and not on the edges. So that's why we are doing this, this translation. It's not purely a game. So you will probably say something about it, but um, all right, that's very beautiful. Uh, now, are you saying from the path integral, we throw out the ones that do not satisfy the causal constraint? That's next slide. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm answering that. 
so far everything was classical. Now I've just given you motivation for what, why we're doing this, because now we want to go to quantum. So let's go to quantum. Ah, no. First, let's go to the dynamics, because so far what we were doing was without the dynamics, which just described what is causality, just kin kinematics. But now let's go to dynamics. Those question. The phases are in the new world. There's yes. Asha, there also the in, the, in the region of Asha. Yes, but we do not feel them faces, but triangles. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the faces are triangles. Right. So let, now let's put some dynamics. Um, so the dynamics, just Einstein equations. How do you get Einstein equations? You can get them from variation on principle. And by starting with an action, and you are looking at what are the the the, 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 what's, what's the word about the minimum saddle point approximation. No, 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 just the saddle point. No, saddle point. What's, what's the stationary points? You look at the stationary points of the action, and you get the the, the solution of the Einstein equations. And uh, this is another way. It's not Einstein but action, but it's Palatini action. So another formulation of GR. It's equivalent. And the difference is that you don't only have the metric as a variable, you also have a fine connection because you can write the Ricci tensor as a function of only one tensor, which is the affine connection. And, uh, and so we are going to, to take this action, the, the, the equivalent one, the discretized setup, and that's called the first order reaction. Okay, when I discretize palatine action, I get first order reaction. action is the name. And, and this action so is defined for some uh, complex of four synthesis. And um, okay, so <laughs> let's look at what this is telling us. So here you have a sum over the four synthesis sigma. You also have you know, four, for each blob of the four synthesis you're summing over. And, and then the second sum is, is so a sum over the wedges for which uh, for simplex you look at the wedges around. And um, what this new is just a variable that we're introducing, which is uh, not really physical in the sense, it's just Lagrange multiplier, which enables you to apply this closure constraint. Okay. Forget about it if you understand, it will not be really useful for what I want to say that. And then we have some uh, geometrical data. So the, the action is a function of the length of the segments. So these segments are the one dimensional thing in my triangulation. And uh, from the segments, I can compute the area of the triangles. So the area of each triangle. And also the dihedral angle between tetrahedra. Because, okay, this is hard to imagine, but you should think that this is in a four dimensional space and you have two tetrahedra that you are gluing to one another, but you are not gluing them like flat. You're gluing them in a curve with some curvature. And this curvature is going to be encoded in some angle that we call dihedral angle. And that's this theta. And uh, this is the fourth order edge action. Now let, let's think of course causality. What are the variables here which carry the causal structure? Of my kinematics, and the answer is simple. It's, it's the dihedral angle only, because okay, I have assumed if you remember that those uh, tetrahedra were space-like, and because they are space-like, it means that the lengths are all positive, and so the areas are all positive, and so there is no causal structure in the areas of the length. The only information about the causal structure. Is contained into the sign of this dihedral angle, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. And okay, if it's if it's positive or if it's negative, it's going to give me an orientation epsilon for the wedge, which is going to be either uh, thin or thick, either space or time, either uh, uh, co-chronal or antichronal. So I have the orientation structure, but a private, and, and then I'm going to do this is just the action. And if I want to get the dynamics, the equations of motion, I need to vary 
this action with respect to the variables which are inside. And what is fun is that if I do that, if I do the equations of motion, the equations of motion are going to imply the Kazan structure. At first, I am working in a kinematical space, configuration space, where all possible orientation for the wedges is everything is possible. But if, if I look at the solutions to the equations of motion, this set of configuration is going to be restricted and imposing this constraint and so imposing a causal structure. So in that sense, the causal structure in this formation is coming from the equations of motion. This is different with GR, with classical general relativity, it was not the case. In classical general relativity, the causal structure is within the metric which is there from the beginning in the kinematical space. You don't need uh, the equations of motion to impose a causal structure. It's just there from the beginning. Here in this formulation, the causal structure is a consequence of the equation. It's only true on shell. Off shell, you have just no causal structure. Flavio, get quite the questions. I'm starting to understand what, what is the sign of this angle. So mm -hmm. does it mean the sign of the angle? Because the angle is it's yeah. very yeah. appropriate. It's yeah. still, exactly. It's so very, but what mm -hmm. you need some yeah. uh, so, reference point to put the sign of the angle. Exactly. But this okay, so the trick is that these angles are not Euclidean angles, they are they are Lorentzian angles. And so Lorentzian angles mean yeah, basically they are the the, the rapidity in uh, in, uh -huh. in special relativity. And, and so the rapidity, uh, yeah, it's not exactly the same intuition. So the sign matters. I have a question. Can I? Yes, Carol. Um, is this result that this uh, causal structure equation that you have in the box uh, follows from the sort of the equation of the motion um, something you've just arrived or something that it was somehow known before in some form? Uh, we have derived it, and I'm not aware that it was known before. Okay. I've not, I've not seen this anywhere else. Yeah. Okay, because it sounds it sounds completely new to me. So, uh -huh. okay. Yeah, it was new to me as well. So this is something that you you you've just come out with uh, in in this paper with. Yep. One one other thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's surprising. Okay, thank you. Yeah. May I also pose a question? Hi, I, I hope you hear me. Yeah, I can. Okay, so what I understand now until this point, you're saying the causal structure is not defined, but will be defined a priori, but will be defined through the equations of motion. Now I would define, I would distinguish between the notion of something being not defined and something which will be like causal structure is indefinite because of kind of quantum superposition. So it's very well defined, but it's not classical. Can you uh, make this distinction or clarify a little bit? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, it's going to be even clearer the lab, next uh, slide. But at this level, I would not interpret uh, this orientation structure as a superposition of causal structure. I think it's really something else. It's like there is no superposition of causal structure. It's just there is no causal structure at all. Um, yeah. So, so far, there is nothing quantum. So, so I cannot really talk of superposition. Uh, okay, it's, uh, next slide is going to make this clear. I hope. And if, if not, ask me the question again. Okay, so now let's go to quantum. We've done the discreteness. We've done uh, the encoding on the two surfaces. We've put the dynamics on, and now let's go to, go to quantum. So quantum means to me now the path integral. We are going to sum over all possible histories. So the way it works is uh, I, I, I have a boundary, which is sigma, which is a discretization of a three-dimensional surface. And this boundary, I can put on it some fixed causal structure. And then I can look at what are all the possible histories inside which are going to fit with this boundary sigma. 
And I'm, the, the goal of the quantum theory is to give you a way to compute the amplitude, which is A, which is a function of the variables on the boundary. And the way it's computed is by doing a path integral, a sum of all the possible histories of uh, basically the, the exponential of the classical action with an i and an h bar. This is it. Uh, well, this product is just the, the implementation of the constraint. But here, otherwise, we have the red j action, exponential to the red j action. And the path integral means summing over all these stories, meaning we are summing over all the possible variables of our, of our action, which are the lengths and the angles. But if we want to look at what, where is the causal structure here, we need to look at these diagonal angles. And so we can rewrite exactly the same uh, amplitude by making explicit the sign of theta. So now I'm making a distinction between eta, which is the sign of eta, of theta. No, sorry. Epsilon, which is the sign of theta, and eta, which is the norm of theta. So this variable is always positive, and this is plus or minus one. It's just the same amplitude, but now I split it, the theta, the diagonal angle, into the information of causal structure, which is contained in this epsilon, and the information about the norm of the diagonal angle, which is in this eta. This is exactly the same expression. Um, and so the causal structure is here. But there is not only the causal structure here, because I'm summing over all possible assignation of orientation to the wedges. Everything is allowed. And so I will have some configuration which are causal and some which are not causal. So that's the first remark. This sum is made over all possible configurations of epsilon assigned to wedges, both causal and non-causal configuration. Second remark, uh, the causal constraint is imposed weakly on shell. This means that in the semi-classical limit, if I do the, the semi-classical limit, so I'm, I'm looking at the variations of the red reaction, only the causal configurations are going to survive. This is a result of the slide before the dynamics. Okay. In the, the, the semi-classical limit, only the solutions which are classical are going to survive. And the classical and solutions of the classical equations mean causal structure. And this is, I formulated it that way, which is the causal constraint is imposed weakly, that is to say on shell. But we could, we could maybe restrict this cell by to impose the causal constraint strongly, that is to say off shell, by saying in this sum, instead of summing over all possible orientation configurations, I only want to sum of the one which have a definite causal structure. And that's the difference between being in a superposition of, of causal structure and, and, and summing over configurations which are not causal at all. Here, I have causal and non-causal configurations. I could decide to only keep the causal structure, but I would still have a, a superposition of causal structure, of path of histories with causal structures. Third remark, the presence of non-causal histories Contributing to the amplitude depends on a certain choice of variables. Here, the variables that we have chosen are variables which are adapted to the wedges, to the two surfaces. But if I take all the variables, like I, I could have started with uh, the ADM variables, but I decompose uh, space time into slices of spaces which evolve in time. Um, in the discrete settings, I, I would have information encoded on edges only. And in that case, all my configuration would be causal. So this feature uh, is not particular to this variable. There was a question here. Yeah. So uh, maybe I could have missed one minute between non causal features or non causal uh -huh. structures. Or yeah. Like yeah. So remember, there are two things. There is a, a big cat a big set of all possible orientation assignation of epsilon. And then within this big set of orientation configurations, there is a subset of it 
which satisfies the causal constraint, mm -hmm. okay, which was in, in the red box. Mm -hmm. And so if, if I'm summing over all big sets, I'm also summing over configurations with no causal structure. But maybe what is no causal structure? so the, the non causal structure are the, the complementary of the causal structure within the orientation structure set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which means another cycle, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, which, which are the orientation which do not satisfy the construct. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this is non causal, what I call non causal. Is it also one for one? Sorry, the not obeying the, the, the causal constraint with having a cycle. I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are these two equal? Yes, these two are equal. Uh, what I've just done is to split this integral, which was which was over all the, the, the real you, axis. You change stretch. variables. I, I, I've just split it into for yeah. Theta, theta a priori can theta a priori can be uh, both positive and negative, so it's over all the real axis. And I'm, I'm just rewriting the same thing, but they're saying that's two integrals, one on, on the positive axis, positive reals and negative reals. That is so. And uh, do you have any, well, uh, maybe you're going to say this, but this is first of all super interesting, I think. Uh, surprising indeed that it wasn't, uh, I mean, it seems simple. Um, Couple of questions. So, first of all, do you have any idea of um, so the ones that do satisfy the causal constraint with respect to the ones that they don't? Do you have any idea how big they are in the total set or in a certain limit? Is this, uh, see what I mean? Is this some zero measure subset? Oh, well, yeah, it's zero measure for sure. If you go to but, uh, it's the size is. Uh, so you go to the limit of infinite uh, vertices. You're saying it's going to be a zero measure. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. So the, the the set of causal configurations is zero measure within the set of all orientation configurations. But okay, uh, next thing, uh, do you see any relevance for killing divergences or anything like that? Since if you you have to make a choice now, are you going to restrict yeah, the, the yeah, 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 yeah. over yeah. those yes. or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that. Yeah. If you so in spin films, just for the others, you have divergences, which means some, some of these integrals go to infinity. And of course, the question, natural question that Marios is asking is, well, if now I'm restricting this sum, uh, I'm restricting the range of integrations, so maybe I'm just going to kill this uh, infinity. And I think that's true. It's killing divergences if we if you restrict the, the causal structure. Yeah. At least you don't know yet. I know we do we do know the spin films. I mean we are showing it in the paper. That's relating to some works that you've done. Right? You had a paper on divergences, and basically your results can be oh my god. We, we can get, get yeah. them from from our thing. I was an intern. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was an intern. Good. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, okay, fourth comment I want to make is that the choice of whether we should include the causal term or not depends on actually what we want to compute. Uh, do we want to compute a projector on the physical Hilbert space, or do you want to compute an evolution operator from some past to time slice? And there's an analogy that can be made with the very simple example of just a particle uh, which is evolving in time. And you want to compute the propagator for this particle in one dimension. And you have, you have different kind of propagator. So the propagator is, that, is W. And uh, what, you have the Feynman propagator, which is satisfying this equation. So you have a delta function. And you have the Adama propagator, which is satisfying the zero. So the, the Adama propagator, if you want, is um, imposing some constraint because this is equal to zero. And you have the Feynman propagator, which is. Uh, the one that one needs to use if wants to compute the right transition amplitude, because in the Feynman propagator, you have here a delta function. And this delta function, if you want, is at the origin of your light, light cone. And, and this Feynman propagator is, is, is imposing some causal structure that you don't have in the other propagator. And so 
It depends what you want to do, whether you should rescue this sum or not. It's, uh, you're not completing the same thing, obviously. And maybe the tricky physical question is which, yeah, when should I, should I use which, which. Right, so, okay, we've been from general relativity, we've done discreteness, then we've been coded on two dimensional surfaces, we've posed some dynamics, and now we've been to quantum. And now let's jump to spin forms. Because this is not directly spin forms, and this is some kind of uh, path integral or sum of our histories. But spin forms is not just that, it's, it's constructed a bit differently. Um, okay, I assume that not all of you know about spin foam. So let me, on this slide, may make a, a crash course about what is spin foam. So, spin foam, if you want to understand that, you need to start with spin network. And what is spin networks? It's a graph. With uh, some labels on this graph. And this graph is uh, the level for a state, and the state which is describing the quantum geometry for space. This is the loop quantum gravity. Okay, just I, did, I described a slice of space with a graph, which I call spin networks. Now, if I want to go to spin form, I need to put some time evolution. And so I want to go from one such graph to another graph, which is different. And the object to go from one to the other is called a spin foam. Okay, so I have an initial spin network, final spin network. And in between, I have some topological structure that they call a spin foam. A spin foam encodes the quantum geometry of space time. So mathematically, it's a generalization of graph. Spin networks were just graphs. This is graph with uh, faces. So it has uh, vertices, it has links, but it has also has faces. Okay, so this exa exactly can be obtained uh, by the procedure that I've shown you before, which is I take the dual of a discrete station and, uh, and I can get a two complex, which is a spin form. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. Um, now, uh, what's the goal of my quantum theory of spin foams is to compute an amplitude, a transition amplitude. What is the probability to go from these spin networks initial to the final spin networks? And the way I'm going to do is I'm going to sum over all possible two complexes, all possible spin foams that I can fit with these boundaries. That's the sum. Now we're going to ask, well, what is this uh, other amplitude then? That's the spin foam amplitude for fixed topology of spin foam. And it's this defined this way. So I have an, an integration and then some products. I have, uh, in, I'm integrating over variables which are associated to the wedges. So you have wedges which are face associated to the vertices. And for each wedge in your spin foam, you have one SU2 variable. That's the group, right? You know. And I'm integrating over all those variables some products, a product for all the faces and a product for all the vertices. This is just a delta function. And this is the product of my uh, wedges around the face. Okay, forget about this. What matters is this amplitude, which is the vertex amplitude. So, what is the vertex amplitude? The vertex amplitude is given by this expression. So now I'm focusing. On, at just one vertex of, of my of my spin foam, and I'm looking around. So it's a function of my wedge variables, which are around my vertex, and I'm integrating over some variables which are associated to the edges, which are going out of my vertex. And these variables belong to the Lorentz group, as you see. And then it's a product of something, product of the wedges surrounding my verte vertex. And this, I call it the wedge amplitude. Yeah, there's an end to that process. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> so what is the wedge amplitude? So, so if you want, yeah, what's the, the philosophy? I started with some amplitude, which was for my, my old spin form, and I, I broke it into integration and products of small parts. And I'm, I'm going to the smallest object in my spin form, which is the wedge amplitude, which is associated just to one wedge. And um, here it is. 
Here's the expression. Okay. And this wedge amplitude is where I am going to find causality. Not surprisingly, right? Now I have wedges. I can look at the wedges. Where is this orientation? And so where is causality? Follow? Now let's go to causal spin force. Um, this issue has already been investigated some other days in the past. Uh, here it is. So I have a wedge amplitude that's just the same ex expression as before. I have a sum here of the, of the spins, just 11, which can take a summing over all half integers, these things. And then I have a series of integrations over uh, a complex plane. Uh, yeah. And well, some expression, some expression, and and here I have exponential to IS, and this S is the wedge action. So if you want the specific expression for this, that's it. Okay. And you have here the immunity parameter. So the immunity parameter is just a real number, which is appearing everywhere in loop quantum gravity, just like a fundamental constant, gamma. OK, but OK. So where, where is causality? So to understand where is causality, um, we need to go to the semi-classical limit because all this is quantum and so it's not really easy to, to understand the geometry of it. To understand the geometry of it, one can do, go to the semi-classical limit and see what it looks like. And morally, morally in the semi-classical limit, this action, the wedge action, is going to turn towards theta wedges, which is the diagonal angle. This is the thing. And so causality, causal structure is, is there. It's in this wedge action. And so now, let me write again this wedge amplitude like this. I'm, I'm, I'm just um, introducing by end, but it's not it's a true equality here. I'm just here introducing a sum of our epsilon which is plus or minus one. But for this to be true, I'm, I'm putting here a theta function, so that the step function, the e side function. Okay. And so I'm just splitting this integral into, just like before, I was splitting it in two, between the positive and the negative um, diagonal angles. Here I'm, I'm doing the same, I'm just splitting in two, except here it's not really the, the diagonal angle that I'm Splitting because it's just, there's just no diagonal angle. The diagonal angle is a semi classical notion, it's just there, the quantum medium. But instead of putting the diagonal angle, I'm putting the wedge action. That's my way to split the, the wedge. And so I'm splitting it in two terms, uh, which correspond to two orientations. Yep. But is this just the determinant of the tetrad? It's just the orientation of the frame. No, because this epsilon is not is associated really to a wedge. It's not associated to a full um, full simplex. So to compute the determinant of the, the tetrad, which would be so the determinant, fine, I fine, guess. Fine. So this extra variable is just the arbitrary convention that you can choose um, of the arrow of time locally. That's, that's not of the no. It's not the arrow of time, but it's whether the wedge is. Is, is encoding space or time? Whether the, the wedge is it going at the quantum level? So you have this spin phone, you look at one wedge, and the question you ask is this wedge, is it enclosing a region of space or a region of time? Is it like this? Wait, I'm like I'm enclosing I'm space, or is it like this enclosing time? This Wait, is the information which is contained in this epsilon. Right. So these two things are equal, right? Yes. So how did you take a, how did you double the number of actions of the, what is the? So it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's just the EV side function. It's just, if you take the EV side ah. plus the EV ah. side minus the argument, yeah. you just okay. take the identity. All right. Just, uh, so it's just by N, I'm introducing this sum, this EV side, just split. By introducing this EV side, the step function, it's a weight. Cut my, my integral into. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, you, you already observe elements which do not satisfy the product structure, but they are exactly zero. 
you know, so at the, we, here we, we there is still no causal constraint because we have the level of wedge. If I just take one wedge, uh, I just have one orientation variable epsilon. Okay. So and, and so if I want, yeah. Say again. You said all possible orientations, but half of them are exactly zero. Zero, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, half of them are going to kill the, the static function. I mean, half of them. Yeah, yeah. This, 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 this side function is a way to divide my integral in, my, in two integrals. Yeah. It's just that. And one is going to correspond to, to a wedge which is enclosing time, and the other is going to correspond to a wedge which is enclosing space, yeah. depending whether. I still this plus one or one. Yeah, but my point is half of the sum at this point, like that's zero. Half, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure what. Yeah. Can no, it's not that. Uh, so, so this action can be positive or negative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, half of the sum except the one with the x of the. S. Now, S, S, S is just a, is a function of all the variables that you have. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 There are terms for which S is positive. And so terms, what do you mean by terms? Uh, terms? I mean, it's just if you have an integral, which mm -hmm. depends uh, for, for all value of the parameters, you have one, one numerical value, and you can do uh, an yeah. integral, but you can mm -hmm. for some of we For some of them, the S is going to be positive. Yeah. And then you will have only the epsilon, which is positive. Yeah. And for the yeah, but, 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 but it's companion zero. Yeah. Yes. So companion which is epsilon in the is zero, and you set it to zero. That's true, but except that since summing here over epsilon, I'm actually preserving two terms, but I'm just organizing them into a different causal wedge. Okay, this is what I call causal wedge amplitude, since now there's this arrangement of the epsilon. And so then we, we can do exactly as before for the path integral. Um, we can look at the full spin form amplitude by considering all the wedges. And, and and so it's it's going to be the sum of all the com possible configurations for the orientation of the wedges, but within them I can divide it in two sums, one for which the configuration are satisfying a causal constraint, and then a term which do not satisfy. Well, before I was calling them non-causal, maybe I should have kept the same term. Yeah, I'm calling them spurious. That's the same thing. So now the, the, you can ask physical questions like, depending on what I want to compute, which of seven one I want to compute, should I should I keep these terms or not? So we, we know that in the semi-classical limit, the causal structure is going to be preserved. So in the, the classical limit, all these terms are going to be zero. But at the full quantum level, uh, uh, do, do you want to in, implement the causality already or not? That's that's a uh, choice. And I think, yeah. So if I make the choice to keep only the causal structure, I think we can understand this as really a, I want to compute the time evolution of my spin network. And if I want to keep both terms, I have a general spin form, and I think this can be understood as a projector on the physical states, which is to say. How do I impose the Hamiltonian constraint on my spin networks? And all right, this is my conclusion. I'm just reminding you a few of the things that we've seen and I think which are interesting. Uh, the first is that causality is exhausting. I lost all the information about the metric except the conformance factor. And that's Madaman's theorem. And I think that's something already, it's a very basic result, but it's important to have it in mind, I think. Then uh, causality can be represented by arrows on the edges of the dual scale, but it can also be encoded on the wedges. But this means that we have more variables, and so we also have one more constraint, which is the causal constraint. And this causal constraint it can be derived from the equations of motion. It's a consequence. Then when we go to the path integral, we can restrict or not to causal histories only. Uh, and that depends on what we want to compute. And in spin forms, we find the same kind of structure, which is the same. Yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Pierre. That was uh, really great.
So um, there is. Um, oh, can I? There's questions in the chat. Let's go first uh, here, and then we'll go to uh, everybody else. Okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, you said on the previous slide you divided this action then in two parts, which you call causal. Actually, the sum of the causal and and the other one which you are causal. You said before. Now the first one, which is a causal, it's still a sum of the causal. So do I understand that if I have a, a, a causal even constraint uh, such that a let me say A is before B, uh, in this sum, I could have both situations that A is before B and before B is before A. And it's a, it's a, it's a very strange thing and I, I like it. I, I want to say that it's not so uninteresting part uh, and I would certainly not call it causal. <laughs> uh, but the other part is also interesting uh, uh, in which uh, one cannot even uh, represent this as, as a superposition A is before B or B before A. And uh, so I would like to, yeah, this is more of a, a question whether this is true, how I understood this, and maybe you can comment on that. And maybe just finally, I mean, I'm sure you are somewhat familiar with, with the process matrix formalism in which both groups appear there. This is of course just uh, not, uh, filled with this physics that you provide now. It's more of abstract formalism, but it's interesting that both groups appear there. Something which is a, of a type of a ca causal, and the example is the, the, the quantum switch that has been appeared in many different um, versions, but there is also this other group that, are, uh, uh, that provides a, a, a positive uh, uh, probabilities and nevertheless cannot be represented as a superposition of causal ones. And we always had the problems with identifying this other group. Is it a physical one? And, and, and if yes, where should we uh, uh, see this? So all what I want to say is this, it's a very interesting talk. And, uh, and thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you, you got it right completely. I mean, exactly this. So in these configurations, which are called causal, I, so if I fix the boundary of, of some boundary in my space time, then this sum considers a different causal structure within the bulk, which match with the boundary. And so in the bulk, I could have events where A is before B or B before A, both are within this sum. And then there are the other ones where I cannot assign such an orientation. Then I'm not familiar with uh, the um, process matrices, but um, matrix process formalism. Process matrices. But uh, I'm not familiar with this, but um, yeah, if, if this is. You should get your say, uh, familiar. That's, yeah, that's really <laughs> interesting. Uh, um, okay. So we can, we can talk during your visit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would be glad to because I'm, I'm not aware of what you said. And, so just to comment on what uh, Chaslav said, I, what he means with the sum is that it's a sum over causal configurations, but the sum is not causal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Carlo, you had a, uh, something to say? Uh, no, no. All right. Um, Luis? Yeah, uh, just maybe a general question on the relation of this with with the spin networks, because uh, I, I'm more familiar with uh, with the original work on the spin networks by Pangos and how he built up this uh, idea of, of. And as far as I know, all that is uh, 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 with uh, with complete discrete uh, uh, computations, right? This is some uh, uh, permutation and combinatorial uh, techniques to compute probabilities with end up which end up being rational numbers and so on. And he wishes to, to the, the probability of, uh, uh, sorry, the structure of, of, of Euclidean space in this case to emerge uh, of, of possible angles and root degenerates to emerge in the left in the large spin limit. But uh, when I see them as spin forms, and this is something I, I always wonder, I see that uh, you already use as 
as uh, by computing the amplitude which would be one spin network and another you use already some I don't know variety degrees of freedom which uh, you integrate on SU2 which is essentially SO3 and somehow I see that you're somehow including already uh, SO3 or SU2 as a, as a, as a structure to this for given uh, which is it's, it's already assumed so my question is that by the variant is also in spin form uh, this structure looking at the emergence of large spins as well or it is included this these quantities which are continuum are included already in the formalism it's already included at the beginning in formalism okay. now you should keep in mind there's difference between the spin networks of Penrose and the spin networks of loop quantum gravity okay. is that for Penrose the spin networks they represent space time Whereas for loop quantum gravity, the spin networks they represent only space. Okay, and that you are going to evolve. But in, in, in Penrose, I'm, I'm not a specialist of Penrose spin networks, but somehow you have one, it's, it's a graph, but there's one direction of time within that graph. So it's, it's a bit different. But it's true that then in spin phones, you are using um, Lie groups like SU2 and SF2C, which are uh, continuous groups, so that you have some smooth structure, everything is not combinatorial, it's got integrals, and that's built in. You just get uh, discrete spectrums of uh, geometrical operators. Yeah. So, the observables, let's say. It's a long story. So, this was a question. Uh, so, maybe a very general one. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very nice. Uh, I was wondering a bit about something. So, how are you sure that uh, a graph is a good object to encode what you want to encode as the photos that you give me? So, you showed some graphs of skeletons. Mm -hmm. So, these are kind of so graph is a, is a very uh, restricted object to uh, describe the logical relations between nodes. So, you can have, let's say, hypergraphs. These are more general objects. Uh, uh -huh. I was wondering, like, uh, how come you only need two dimensional and not more dimensions for, for the relations? Well, what, what, what I've said is that you have the choice, first of all. You can encode causal structure with only, only on the edges, but you can also encode them only on the wedges. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, and both are equivalent. To some relations, mm -hmm. and so it's it's not given a priori what you should do. Mm -hmm. uh, both are possible, both are equivalent. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling me in this picture, I have graph. Why not hypergraphs? But I, I don't need it. Um, okay. If I want, if I'm doing a discrete, uh, when I'm going from a smooth to a discrete structure. The full information that I have about my light cones mm -hmm. can light cone is a look it's a local notion, right? Something which is at each point of my manifold, I have some light light cone, it's local. And every every point of my manifold, I have a local light cone. Mm -hmm. And this local light cone, the only information that it carries mm -hmm. can be encoded uh, by local relations as well in discretization. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, there's really a one-to-one -one correspond condom. Yeah, it's one to one correspondence between structure. And when I'm doing to the dual picture, it's again the same. I'm losing, when I'm going to that graph, I'm losing no information. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't need an hypergraph just because mm -hmm. I can do it that way. So, so for example, the narrow means uh, the possibility of the vertex, the two vertices that are connected with the narrow, mm -hmm. one point from one to another means that one can split between the like yeah, exactly. Which means that the signal can be sent from one to another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This one in the future light code is this point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And now, well, you, you could say, you could, maybe one question you could say that since there are arrows everywhere, I can only have time like relations. How, is it, how can I have space like relations? Yes. And the, the answer to that question is that the space time, the space like relation, they, they don't exist at the very local level, but they exist at the global level. For instance, I could have here an, another node. Well, just this one, this one, and this one, mm -hmm. they are space-like related. Yeah. 
Okay, so the space like uh, structure appears at a, a more global level. It's not there, I'm just uh, yeah. showing the level, but it's there. No, no, just what I have in mind is that it, it could be that, uh, let's say, that uh, two nodes, uh, so there is information transferred between two nodes, but there's not individual information in each node, but there is information at the joint of two nodes. So you have one node that sends information to two other ones in the future, but these two do not have any local information, they have global information. And to, to, to somehow like represent this relation, this object in terms of signals, you need this hypergraphs. That's why I was wondering, like, okay, because this is a feature of quantum theory, that you have non local information distributed. Mm -hmm. So it could be uh, at least this is mm -hmm. I have it right down there mm -hmm. a lot. So when, when you are doing this discretization, yeah. uh, you can implement a local volume by just assigning some local volume to the four synthesis. Mm -hmm. And it's just because from, from your smooth manifold, you are cutting it in some way. And each patch that you are, which is going to correspond to a homomorphism to a four simplex, just compute the volume. You assign it to the first four simplex, so it's there. Uh, but this is the information that we are losing when we go on this graph, because on this graph I have no volume information. I could implement the volume information on this graph just by assigning a number to each node, and this node would correspond to the volume of my four simplex. And in that case, I would have my full metric structure on the graph. I would have both light cones and conformal factor, so local volume, and so. In a way, I could reconstruct my, my metric fully. Yeah. Because my, yeah, my question is also if, if there, I mean, I assume that when you do, when you compute your action uh, at a quantum level, you expect, of course, at some point to have some prediction which will, be, which will deviate from classical general relativity. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take the usual quantum, uh, for, I don't know, QB or any quantum theory, you have inside the theory the, the fact. The class constant, which in a way gives you the scale at which you should observe deviation for class uh -huh. constant. So my question is, is there some, some way to implement something similar saying that if you mm -hmm. if somehow your the space is discrete at let's say some scale or anything, yeah. is there some way that the scale appears explicitly in the action that you get at the end? So yeah. you can say, okay, if I'm looking somehow uh, consider that most mm -hmm. over uh, the scale very large with respect to some scale, it should recover exactly classical GR. And if I look at something comparable or smaller than some scale of any other mm -hmm. scale, I should find something different. Yeah. So in new quantum gravity, you indeed have H bar, which appears uh, mm -hmm. like in the area of spectrum, for instance. Mm -hmm. The spectrum of the area is discretized, and the spectrum, I think, is proportional to H bar. Uh, yeah, and the, and the image. So, yeah. so this is the definition of semi-classical limit of the yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the semi-classical limit is precisely like in my it's uh, sad actually. Yeah, yeah. In my path integral here I have h bar here. When h bar goes to zero, that's the semi-classical limit. But roughly speaking, yeah. roughly, yeah. yeah. Um, being, uh, Basically, you send the first gap of the eigen uh, of the spectrum of uh, the area to uh, zero. But, then, yeah. but there is a very separate, but let's not go into that. It's not really relevant to 
Yes. Um, I'm, no, maybe, I, okay. I would suggest if we wrap up here, I know I see that there's a lot of interest. I encourage everybody to continue the discussion with Pierre. Just wanted to give one last chance uh, to the people. Uh, Carlo, Chaslav, do you want to say anything? No, no thank you. Fine. Thanks a lot. Just right. thank you, um, uh, Pierre. That was very, very, very good. I, I, a lot of things I didn't know. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Carlo. See you soon.